Thanks, Nadia. I definitely have never considered myself a celebrity, um, but uh, thank you for uh, uh, inviting me. Um, it's a very uh, cool uh, moment in that um, Dr. Chitness, who's going to be speaking next, was my mentor in fellowship, uh, and then Dr. Benson was our mentee in fellowship, and then we also have John Santoro here, who's our current mentee, who are all training, um, so it's kind of a, a family affair, um, but also to give you a sense of um, the, the significant interest in the field, especially in pediatrics. Adult neuroimmunology was, was way ahead of, of pediatric neuroimmunology, um, but we've, taken, we've made a lot of great strides in the field, um, in large part due to our adult uh, colleagues. <coughs> so I'll be talking today about acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, and I'll focus on the pediatric perspective mostly. And my colleague uh, from Mass General, Dr. Mateen, uh, will tag team, and she will do the uh, adult-focused portion. Um, and I'm a pediatric neurologist, and I work at Boston Children's Hospital. Um, so this is a, a patient that I saw, and my initial impetus uh, to get involved in pediatric neuroimmunology was seeing patients with these conditions during my residency. Um, so this would be kind of a, a typical case, a patient who's a three-year-old boy who presented with a four-day history of fever, lethargy, and imbalance. Um, and two weeks prior, he had had an upper respiratory tract infection, um, which had resolved. And on exam, he had lethargy, alternating with irritability, slurred speech, uh, was off balance, and then had abnormal reflexes. Um, as is often done in emergency rooms, he had a CAT scan, which was normal, um, and had a lumbar puncture, which had a mild elevation in those uh, white blood cells uh, that Dr. Benson uh, alluded to. Uh, this is his brain MRI. Um, we've lo looked at a lot of uh, spine MRIs uh, so far. Um, here is a brain MRI. Um, and uh, here we see we're taking basically uh, cross sectional slices. Uh, the black areas are the ventricles, which carry the spinal fluid. Um, and we see here that there are multiple areas on both sides of the brain um, where there's uh, the signal is too white, and it's particularly affecting uh, the white matter, um, but it's also affecting some structures of, of the gray matter. And so this would be a very uh, typical MRI appearance of a patient with ADEM. If we were to do a brain biopsy, and thankfully it's uh, extremely rare, if ever, that we would resort to a brain biopsy to make the diagnosis of ADEM, and, but if we were to biopsy one of those lesions and look at it under the microscope, uh, we would see, um, and I'll focus you here, uh, these are veins, um, and all of the blue areas are normal myelin, but around the veins, you've lost the myelin. And so this is a, a characteristic pathological pattern of ADEM, where you lose myelin uh, around the veins, and that's due to uh, cells, lymph, those white blood cells coming out of the vasculature and into the brain tissue. Um, so how do we uh, define ADEM? So prior to 2007, um, there was no established definition of ADEM, and it really led to varying application of the diagnosis, both clinically um, and in research, and led to a lot of confusion and inconsistent findings. Um, the International Pediatric MS Study Group um, proposed uh, the first definition in 2007 and revised it in 2013. I think that was a big, very big step forward in the field so that we could all be uh, speaking the same language. Ben earlier mentioned how uh, simply coining the term AFM and being consistent with it was an important step forward in AFM. The same thing occurred uh, in ADM research. Um, I won't go through this in uh, all of the details, but just to highlight some of the key features. Uh, so it's a polyfocal, meaning that it affects multiple areas of the central nervous system event of presumed, uh, so we don't always know that it's uh, inflammatory demyelination, but we're using different clues to make that presumption. This was, and then the second bullet point was the key uh, and co most controversial part of the definition, um, which was that in order to make a diagnosis of ADEM, you had to have what we, as neurologists, call encephalopathy, which means that your level of consciousness needs to be altered or your behavior needs to be altered, and it can't be explained by other things. Um, brain MRI shows uh, findings consistent with demyelination, 
And then we'll get to this a little bit later in the talk, but um, you can't have any new uh, findings after a three-month time window. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the requirement for mental status changes or encephalopathy was, it was and continues to be uh, a controversial area in the field. Uh, I'm a proponent of including it um, in, in the requirement for the definition, uh, particularly in children, um, because I think it does more benefit than, than harm in requiring it. Um, uh, a group at uh, Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh um, looked at, okay, what, how encephalopathic are the patients? And it was approximately 50-50, uh, that about 50% of the patients had milder versions of encephalopathy, so they were sleeping more or they were irritable, and about 50% had more profound encephalopathy. They were frankly confused um, or even uh, comatose. And when they looked at uh, what, was, what were their findings on other testing and how did they do in the long term, um, there was no difference between the group. Um, this just lays the landscape a little bit, um, similar to previous slides that we've seen, but trying to think where does ADEM fit uh, within uh, the, the framework of other demyelinating conditions. And I'll focus your attention on this side. So as I mentioned, it affects multiple different parts of the central nervous system, hence the disseminated uh, term. And you have multiple, lesion, multiple areas affected, you have an abnormal mental status, and you have ADEM. And as you've heard and will hear, uh, other talks will have focused on myelitis and optic neuritis. Um, ADEM is overall a rare condition, um, depending on which study you look at, anywhere between one and six uh, per million children per year. Um, and overall, if we look at all children who come uh, to the hospital with a first time demyelinating event, about 20 to 25 percent will meet criteria for ADEM. Most of, of the children uh, who are diagnosed with ADEM are young, um, and so this was a study uh, from California, uh, which looked at uh, the proportion of presentations of first-time demyelinating events. And on this side, we have zero to 12 years, and on this side, uh, 13 to 18 years. And the green um, is uh, ADEM. So you can see a big uh, piece of the pie, uh, around 30% or so in the younger children, less than 12, um, and a very, very small slice here in the uh, over 13 and above. So it, it preferentially affects younger children. The other thing we notice here is that in the younger children, it's uh, predominantly, it's, it's most more uh, boys than girls, and after puberty, more girls than boys. Um, I uh, summarized uh, lots and lots of cases by looking through the literature. Um, I did take cases uh, both from the sort of pre-2007 era um, as well as the post-2007 era. Um, so this is kind of a summary of all those studies, over 500 cases. Um, as we mentioned, it tends to affect young children uh, with a mean age between five and eight. And there is a slight uh, predominance of boys. And uh, similar to transverse myelitis, a preceding infection um, in about two thirds, um, and less commonly a vaccine um, in about 5% occur in the one to two weeks before uh, the onset of neurological symptoms. Um, many children, when they first come to the hospital, uh, there's uh, appropriate concern that this could be a direct infection um, of the brain uh, uh, and central nervous system. And so one uh, priority in assessing patients is to rule out an infection um, because these patients can have, about half have fever, 40% uh, have headache, and about a third have neck stiffness. Um, and so the initial concern is often, is this meningitis, is this encephalitis, and we do a testing to try to rule out those conditions. And then focusing more on the neurological symptoms, uh, because ADEM can affect multiple different areas of the brain and spinal cord, there's a wide variety of symptoms. Um, weakness is a very common symptom in about half of the patients, uh, ataxia or being off balance in about a third. Cranial nerve deficits, so these would be things like double vision um, or uh, slurred speech um, in about a third. Uh, seizures, epileptic seizures in about a quarter, and vision loss in about 15%. Um, the typical uh, workups, as I mentioned, oftentimes uh, when children first come to the emergency room with these set of symptoms, 
uh, they oftentimes will get a CAT scan. The CAT scan is not a good test for ADEM. It only would pick up about four out of 10 uh, patients. Um, and then oftentimes patients will have a lumbar puncture, uh, which is abnormal in about uh, two thirds of the patient. So the take home point here, and when I talk, give this talk to uh, either general pediatricians or to uh, pediat general pediatric neurologists, you know, a, a normal CAT scan and a normal spinal tap does not rule out ADEM, and you have to keep going and keep working. And so the diagnostic test of choice is a brain MRI, um, and as we saw, uh, it affects both sides of the brain. Um, it's different on the left side and the right side, so it's asymmetric, and they tend to be large uh, lesions, and they preferentially affect certain areas of the white matter. Um, but you can get uh, gray matter involvement as well. Um, because we don't have, in most patients, and we'll get to one different situation in a minute, but because in most patients we don't have, especially when they're first presenting to us, an absolute definitive test um, at the bedside to make the diagnosis, um, we have to also consider other diagnoses. And I'll just uh, jump to the pictures here. Um, at first glance, these might appear uh, to be patients with ADEM, but in fact, this is a generally healthy patient who has migraines. Um, this is a patient who had something called vasculitis. This is from a patient who, who did have a direct viral infection of the brain tissue. Um, this is a patient who turned out to have lupus. Um, this is a patient with an inherited genetic uh, white matter disorder. And this patient we thought may have had a brain tumor, turns out actually did have demyelination. Um, but these are just some of, the, some of the categories of diseases that we run through in our head as we're trying to make a diagnosis of ADEM. Um, there's no like absolute well-established standard diagnostic workup, uh, but in our patients we, we try to get both brain and spinal cord uh, imaging uh, in all the patients. Uh, as well as a spinal tap, and then additional studies to look for some of these mimicking conditions. I'll draw your attention here, um, and uh, as I've updated the slides over the years, uh, this has gotten into the slide uh, because uh, we now will test all the patients for anti-MOG and anti-NMO or aquaporin-4 antibodies. There's a huge, huge list of tests that could possibly be sent, and it really needs to be guided by the specific uh, clinical situation. Once we confirm the diagnosis, um, there have been no uh, randomized controlled trials of treatment of ADEM, um, but it's become a standard of care in the field to treat with high-dose IV steroids, um, typically for five days. Uh, most patients will fall into the middle category where they'll have a pretty significant uh, recovery, and it's pretty amazing um, and gratifying to see uh, the, the rate of improvement within the hospital, in the hospitalization itself. Um, and then we'll follow that with an oral steroid taper over about four to six weeks. There's some low-level evidence to suggest that continuing a, a, an oral taper over a period of longer than three weeks may reduce early return of symptoms. Um, for patients who don't um, have as much recovery as we would like in the acute phase, um, both plasma exchange, as was discussed earlier, uh, as well as IVIG or treatment options. In terms of the prognosis, um, thankfully, uh, most patients do uh, quite well. Um, and this is, I'm focused here on, on pediatric patients. Um, about 80% will have a full recovery, um, and most of that recovery occurs within the first six months. Um, however, you can have uh, residual symptoms, um, and I'll focus a little bit on some of the studies that have looked at those uh, specific symptoms. Um, one very recent study uh, was published, it was a small number of children, uh, 16 children, uh, but focused on an area that we haven't heard much uh, previously in patients with ADEM, um, but looked at that, them in the long-term phase. Um, and on a group level, if you were to compare those children to, to healthy children, children who did not have ADEM, they reported increased rates of fatigue, reduced exercise capacity, and impaired uh, motor performance. <coughs> We also um, think about the cognitive outcomes in ADEM, and because it's such a dramatic uh, presentation with like physical symptoms, uh, sometimes the cognitive symptoms uh, can be overlooked. Um, and oftentimes uh, when you see children back in clinic, let's say six months later, a year later, they look great. They run down the hallway into your office, your you do your neurological exam, it looks normal. Um, you may have repeated a brain MRI, it may be completely normal. And so it's easy to overlook uh, potential cognitive uh, sequelae. Uh, 
Um, there was actually a recent meta-analysis where, where they compiled seven, seven studies that had been previously done. And the good news is that, again, similar to the physical outcomes, most patients uh, do well uh, with good cognitive outcomes, although there was a trend towards a lower processing speed. Um, but we still pay close attention to the possibility of uh, adverse cognitive outcomes, particularly in the youngest children um, who seem to be at the highest risk. You, know, you might, might say, well, why, why do some patients have residual symptoms? This is typically a one-time event. It's generally treated uh, effectively. Um, this was a study uh, from our colleagues in Canada uh, which looked at uh, serial brain MRIs over time. I and mean, in patients who had had a variety of different uh, uh, acute demyelinating conditions in childhood. And uh, what they showed was that there was actually uh, reduced ex expected brain growth um, after ADM. So even though it was a one-time event, um, the, the brains of those children didn't grow at the expected rate over time. Um, I say this not to, not to as like a, an alarmist, um, Again, emphasizing that most children do quite well. Um, but I think for, the, for uh, children and teenagers who have residual symptoms after ADEM, um, I think this might provide actually some reassurance and validation of their, of their symptoms that, no, th this, th they, their brains did take a significant impact and there, there are things that we have to do to continue to support them uh, over time, even after the acute period has ended. Um, in terms of relapses, again, this is pediatric oriented. About 85% have a one time event. Um, uh, zero to five percent will have a second um, ADEM attack, which we call multiphasic ADEM. And uh, uh, any, depending on the study that you look at, anywhere from zero to 10% will develop MS. Um, over the past several years, we've now, uh, as a field, come to realize um, that ADEM can be the initial presentation of NMO. Um, and uh, we've heard about that. Uh, it can also be the first presentation of ADEM followed by optic neuritis um, and other uh, chronic relapsing demyelinating disorders. I'll just briefly uh, give a teaser for Dr. Chitnis's talk on anti-MOG antibodies. Um, and so this study was uh, published from the Mayo Group and they looked at uh, anti-MOG antibodies tested at onset and then over time and if you had anti-MOG antibodies still present uh, three months after the ADEM attack, uh, that predicted a, a, a quite a high risk of relapse um, with 88% risk of relapse. Skip that. One, one and this is, a, this is a key difference between kids and adults, um, is follow-up MRI. So unlike adults uh, who can, generally speaking, lay still in an MRI scanner, um, young children, three, four, five years old, uh, that's much more of a challenge. Uh, we've gotten better as a field in pediatric neurology and neuroradiology of uh, shortening scan time and uh, uh, using distraction techniques um, to try to reduce the need for sedation, but many children will still require sedation. So we're constantly trying to balance the desire to get follow-up MRI and more information um, with the risks of sedation. Um, this was actually a recent study, um, a small number of patients, 13 patients uh, from a Dutch cohort of children, and they looked at the, the subset of patients who had serial MRIs, and um, it turned out that uh, the majority of patients, 77%, if, if you did an early MRI within the first three months, um, you, would see, you would see worsening on the MRI. Um, and you might be worried that perhaps this is not ADM, maybe it's something of a more chronic condition. Um, but when they look, continued to look at them, uh, none of the patients in the long term met criteria for MS um, or, or any other chronic demyelinating condition. So the take home point for me from this study was that, you know, don't, don't get too alarmed by uh, early worsening on the MRI. Um, so, Take home points, and then I'm going to hand it off uh, to my colleague, Dr. Mateen, um, to focus on the uh, adult aspects of ADEM. Uh, I'm a strong proponent of using the uh, recommended criteria to make the diagnosis of ADEM. Um, we need to rule out other conditions which can mimic ADEM. Most patients do quite well, um, with uh, about 80% having a full recovery and 85% having a one-time attack. But um, we need to be 
uh, vigilant about residual symptoms, both physical and cognitive, um, and uh, the, the imaging data would support uh, that that is a, a possibility. And then onset and follow-up MOG antibodies and potentially MRI may play an important role. Um, after seeing all the pictures of kids, I couldn't help but put a picture of, uh, I have twins, this is only one of them, uh, so I don't tell the other one. Uh, but, and also to, to continue on the baseball theme, um, let's just say, uh, you know, the game ended last night at like 3.30 in the morning, I think. Um, I did not stay up. I watched uh, nine innings of the 18-inning game. Um, I think right now for the day, we're at about, roughly about the sixth inning or so, so hang in there. Um, but the, re the reason why I didn't watch all 18 innings, uh, which is good, because I don't know if I'd be able to give this talk today, um, is that although I work in Boston, I did not grow up in Boston. Um, and so this was, this is my, uh, <laughs> this is uh, my son, Luca, who, um, sorry for all the baseball. If you don't like baseball, you're probably like, why are they talking about so much baseball? But um, so in the Yankees play, I'm a Yankees fan. I grew up, born and raised in New York. Yankees played the Red Sox in the, in the first round of the playoffs. And uh, in game three, uh, the Red Sox absolutely crushed the Yankees. It was like a historic loss. Um, and so I was all bummed out. Um, and then the next day, my son said, Dad, I want to wear my Yankee shirt. And uh, so this was him the next day, proudly wearing his Yankee shirt um, after that. This is also kind of how I felt with his arms up, like, what, what happened? Uh, and also kind of like a little bit nervous um, when I was talking with Gigi, and she said, you know what? We really want you to also include some adult uh, ADEM data, and I thought, <laughs> uh, I don't see adults anymore. I saw adults during my fellowship, but um, so thankfully, Dr. at the last minute, I kind of panicked, and uh, Dr. Mateen stepped in and said she would cover the adult topic. So I will turn it over to her. Uh, uh.